Chaiva Narottamam Chaiva Narottamam Devim Sarasatim Vyasam Devim Sarasatim Vyasam Tato Jaya Mudiraya Tato Jaya Mudiraya Nasta Praeshu Vabhadreshu Nasta Praeshu Vabhadreshu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Shloke Bhakti Bhavati Naishtaki We're reading Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 3, Chapter Number 6, entitled Creation of the Universal Form. Text number 39. Ato Bhagavato Maya Ato Bhagavato Maya Ato Bhagavato Api Mohini Api Api Mohini Yat Swayam Chatma Vatma Matma Atma Yat Swayam Chatma Vatma Yat Swayam Chatma Vatma Atma Yat Swayam Chatma Vatma Naveda Kim Utapare Naveda Kim Utapare Naveda Kim Utapare Naveda Kim Utapare Ato Bhagavato Maya Ato Bhagavato Maya Mainam Apimohini Mainam Apimohini Yatvayam Chatma Vatmatma Yatvayam Chatma Vatmatma Naveda kim utapare, Naveda kim utapare, Ato Bhagavato Maya, Ato Bhagavato Maya, Mainam Apimohini, Mainam Apimohini, Yatsvayam Chatma Vatmatma, Yatsvayam Chatma Vatmatma, Naveda kim utapare, Naveda kim utapare, Bhagavata, Bhagavata, godly, godly. Maya, Maya, potency, potency. Mainam, Mainam, 
of the jugglers. Of the jugglers. Api, Api, even, even. Mohini, Mohini, enchanting. enchanting. Yat, Yat, that. that. Oh, that which. That Swayam, Swayam, personally. personally. Cha, Cha, also. also. Atma Vatma, self sufficient, Atma, self, Na, does not, Veda, no, Kim, what, Uta, to speak of, Apare, others. Translation the wonderful potency of the Supreme Personality of Godhead is bewildering even to the jugglers. That potential power is unknown even to the self-sufficient Lord, so it is certainly unknown to others. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. The froggish philosophers and mundane wranglers in science and mathematical calculation may not believe in the inconceivable potency of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But they are sometimes puzzled by the wonderful jugglery of man and nature. Such jugglers and music magicians of the mundane world are actually puzzled by the jugglery of the Lord in his transcendental activities. But they try to adjust their bewilderment by saying that it is all mythology. There is, however, nothing impossible are mythological in the Supreme Omnipotent Person. The most wonderful puzzle for the mundane wranglers is that while they remain calculating the length and breadth of the unlimited potency of the Supreme Personality, His faithful devotees are set free from the bondage of material encasement, simply by appreciating the wonderful jugglery of the Supreme in the practical field. The devotees of the Lord see the wonderful dexterity in everything with which they come in contact in all circumstances. In all circumstances of eating, sleeping, working, etc. A small bunion fruit contains thousands of small seeds and each seed holds the potency of another tree, which again holds the potency of many millions of such fruits as causes and effects. So the trees and seeds engage the devotee in meditation about the activities of the Lord, while the mundane wranglers waste time in dry speculation and mental concoction, which are fruitless in both life and both this life and the next. In spite of their pride in speculation, they can never appreciate the simple potential activities of the banyan tree. Such speculators are poor souls destined to remain in matter perpetually. Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Jaksuran Militanena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale 
Swayam rupa kadamayam dadati swapadantikam. Bandeham Shri Gara Shri Yata Padakamalam Shri Karun Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sakrajatam Sahagana Raganathanditam Tam Sajevam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakanitamscha He Krishna Karana Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpade Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namastade Tapta Kanchana Gorange Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vishapanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Jai Shri Krishna Chaitan Vanchakaupata Rubyasya Kripa Sindhu Vayevaja Patita Nam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namo Namam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shrimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Pracharine Nirvisesha Sunyavadi Paschacha Desatarine Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Atvaita Gadadha Shri Vasade Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So we're hearing Maitreya instruct Vidura about the creative powers of the Supreme Lord, creation of the universal form. The Lord's Shristi Tattva, the crea how the Lord creates this cosmic manifestation. It's already been discussed in the second canto. It comes, I think there's three presentations of creation. The one is Sukadeva Goswami to Maharaj Parikshit. Here you have Maitreya instructing Vidura. It's important for us to understand the creative power of the Lord. Because without appreciating the inconceivable potency of the Lord, we will never be able to understand the Lord's pastime. His Leela in Vrindavan with the devotees, with the people in Vrindavan. It, it's very important that we appreciate there is such a thing as Achintya Shakti. Achintya Shakti, meaning inconceivable power. And Prabhupada explains here in the purport how the empirical scientists, they cannot appreciate that. They will never accept that. Their whole life is to measure everything and calculate everything, to use their science and technology that everything should be calibrated. They should, and they try to do these things, but of course, they, they can never fully appreciate everything. Even on this one planet, there's so many inconceivable powers which are beyond the powers of these mundane scientists and philosophers to appreciate. The common example is of the sun, how the sun is giving so much light, heat and light every day and it's never exhausted. It is inconceivable power. 
we have some power, we burn some fuel, we burn some wood and so on, but it's very limited. How long it will burn, it's limited. But the sun, every day without fail, the sun is there and it's emitting so much heat and light. Where is it coming from? Material scientists can never begin to understand these things. So it's important for us to understand that there is such a thing as achintya shakti, inconceivable powers, things which are just beyond our comprehension. But uh, it's important for us to also appreciate the wonderful powers which the Lord has. And Prabhupada talks about being a, a, a juggler, <laughs> juggling things. The Mayavadis, they're also good in juggling words, you know, they like to juggle words and come up with their theories and philosophies. But here Prabhupada is applying the word jugglery in relation to Lord Krishna and his different potencies. He says uh, ordinary people, scientists and technologists, they, they have some expertise in jugglery, but it can never compare to the inconceivable potency of the Supreme Lord that his jugglery is just far beyond our ability to understand. Therefore, when we try to explain the pastimes of Lord Krishna, if we simply go to the Lord's pastimes in Vrindavan, where he's maybe killing demons and, or dancing with the gopis and all of these, these things can never be understood by the ordinary people until they first of all accepted that there is such a thing as achintya shakti. And Srila Prabhupada comments how these people, they will simply say that our presentation of God is just some mythology. They say, oh, just stories, it's not real, it can't be true, it's all myths, they will say. Hmm. And there are many uh, scholars and philosophers, they write books about the Hindu myths, all the myths of the Hindus, you know, the Indian culture, it's full of mythology. They say, no proof. Of course, we see the proof every day because we, we see the inconceivable potency of the Lord, how he is maintaining this whole cosmic manifestation in a very orderly manner. When we look up at the sky and we see so many planets are there every day, we can see how the sun is rotating and how the moon is also rotating, how they're moving in different ways, how the sun is rising and then setting and the moon is moving in the course of a month it's moving, becoming shadow and then becoming full in a very systematic manner, not haphazard, not recklessly, but very carefully controlled. And when we point out these things, of course the, the materialistic people, they, oh, they don't like to hear, they have no answer, they just run away. They just say, no, no, you people, just myths, just fairy tales, what you believe in, can it, not true at all. So it's, it's a difficult job. How do we, how can we preach to these people? Well, really the first things which we have to do in order to penetrate, jai, panchatattva ki jai, in order to penetrate into the, minds of these materialistic people, it's important for them to chant the holy name. They have to hear the holy name and they have to start to chant. 
If they don't start to chant the Maha Mantra, then it will be practically impossible to penetrate to them. We have to get them to chant, to agree, to begin to chant, and, of, and accepting prasadam. These two things, the distribution of prasadam and the distribution of the holy name, there are real weapons in this Kali Yuga to penetrate into the minds of these materialistic people who are bewildered by so many atheistic philosophies. Atheistic philosophies, we see things like if we ask the, the ordinary person to explain creation to us, they will talk about things like, oh, the black hole, everything came out from the black hole or the Big Bang Theory, and they have these ideas, you know, everything came about like that, you know. The whole city of Stockholm came out from the black hole, right? It just suddenly appeared. Or, or there was a Big Bang, and we woke up in the morning, and there it was, Stockholm, right? Of course, it's ridiculous. And we think that your theories are all mythology. You think our theories are mythology. Your theories are more ridiculous than ours. At least we relate our creation to personalities, that there are people involved, but not people of this world, people who are beyond this creation, beyond this creation. So we, we try to explain these very basic points to common people. So many atheistic, the Darwin's theory, another atheistic theory that we've all evolved from the apes. And these kind of theories are being taught in, for example, schools like Christ, Christian schools. They will teach Darwin theory. They're supposed to believe in God. But they teach that all men evolved from the apes. So all of these, uh, Prabhupada points out, theory, theory, it, there's no proof. It's just a theory. It's a speculation. So, of course, there are two processes of receiving knowledge. One is speculation and the other is by deduction. We receive knowledge, the descending process. It's better to take knowledge in the descending process rather than the ascending process. And we give the very simple example, you want to know who your father is, you ask your mother. You don't go to every man, are you my father, are you my father, are you my father? We go to the mother and the mother immediately can say who is the father. So in the same way we want to understand who is God, who is the father of this creation, we have to hear from the mother. And the Vedas are like the mother because they tell us about the father. So hearing is very important. Of Kali Yuga, people are so stubborn, they don't like to hear. They like to talk. They have their own ideas, their own theories. We are presenting scriptural evidence of the nature of the origin of life and how everything came about. Here we have the, the, how creation took place. And people will say, oh, it is just mythology. It is just make-believe. Well, even if it is make-believe, still we would never go back to the material life because the life of the material world is just so unbearable that we'd rather live in this world, even if it is make-believe, rather than be a mudha, a karmi, and caught in the modes of material nature. Prabhupada, of course, gave us many arguments, many points in, in relation to this, to understand this principle 
to understand the inconceivable potency of the Lord. A famous example is the story of the cobbler and the Brahmin. Hmm, right, the cobbler, Narada Muni is going to Vaikuntha, and the cobbler and the Brahmin both want to know, when will I get to go back to Vaikuntha? When will I get to go to God? And Narada Muni then, after he'd gone to Vaikuntha, he came and told the Brahmana, you're not going for many lifetimes. And the Brahmana, of course, was very angry. Why not? I don't believe you even went there to see the Lord. And if you went there, what was he doing? And Narada Muni said, yes, he was threading the elephant through the eye of a needle. And the Brahmana said, just see how ridiculous. Oh, don't waste my time anymore. Get away from here. All right? And Narada Muni didn't like the, the Brahmana didn't like to hear from Narada Muni. But when he told the cobbler that the Lord said, very soon you're coming back, and, and he told him that the Lord was threading the elephant through the eye of a needle, the Brahmana thought, how, the cobbler rather, the cobbler thought, how wonderful my Lord is. And Prabhupada makes the same point here in the purport that the devotees are always impressed about the jugglery of the Lord, how the Lord is so magnificent, how he can juggle, he can do so many wonderful things. And this is what gives pleasure to the devotee. Devotees become absorbed in thinking about the wonderful activities of Lord Krishna. So, uh, it, it's important for us, therefore, to hear about Lord Krishna and to hear from the beginning. And from the beginning means hearing this Shristi Tattva, this process of creation. Because when we hear how the, how the Lord is creating this whole cosmic manifestation, then we will have greater appreciation for his inconceivable potency it will be much easier for us then to accept that the Lord can do many wonderful things. And just like you can see, there's one, I saw one painting, all the cows and cowherd boys are entering into Agasura's mouth. Right? It's a wonderful pastime. Yeah, nice painting. Uh, I was looking at that painting. And that is an example. Lord Krishna, he's watching the cowherd boys. And he's thinking, well, how powerful the material energy is. That it, even the cowherd boys, and co they're all going into the mouth of Agasura. And so, <laughs> Lord Krishna, when he first saw Aga, he thought, oh, how, how wonderful, how amazing this material energy is. It could create such a monster, such a, a huge form, such a gigantic form as this Agasura, like so many miles long and a mouth wide, it was like, you know, a huge cave. So Krishna, was, even Krishna was impressed. Of course, Krishna is omniscient, he knows everything. But it says here, Maitreya says, uh, the potential power is unknown even to the self-sufficient Lord. That even Lord Krishna himself, sometimes he, he, he's thinking how amazing, how powerful this energy is. Lord Krishna knows everything, but because everything is expanding, it's always expanding, so as it expands, oh, he, he has to again consider, oh, what has happened? It, all of this has come about. He has to review the situation, he has to constantly review. He knows everything, but still because the, the, the potencies are all expanding, they're dynamic, they're not static, they're dynamic, they're expanding, and the Lord is therefore sometimes even bewildered by them. Just like uh, it was, Pondraka was fighting Lord Krishna, and at one point, Pundraka tried, he, he produced a, a, an illusory form of Vasudev. 
Krishna's father. And he pulled out his sword and he cut off Vasudev's head and he held up Vasudev's head to Lord Krishna. And Lord Krishna was stunned. Oh, you know, my father, oh, my father. And of course, Lord Krishna knew that this is an Amaya Vasudev. But still, just temporarily, the Lord was stunned. And, and he went on to kill Pondraka. And so the Lord has this inconceivable power. And the more we hear about Krishna, the more we become am amazed at how wonderful Lord Krishna is. How he's so amazing. He, he's not only attractive, but he's so, he's so kind and benevolent. He cares so much about his devotees. Just like when he went to visit his devotees, he cut we come out from Dwarka and he went to visit Shrutadev, the Brahman, and at the same time he went to Bahulasva. And very nice pastime, it describes how the Lord expanded in two forms, and all everyone who was with him, they also expanded into two. And what one group went to Bahulasva, and in King Bahulasva's palace. They enjoyed everything, all opulence, you know, very beautiful and very comfortable and very luxurious food. And then they, at the same time, Lord Krishna, with all of his sages, his whole entourage, they were all in the home of Shrutadev, the Brahmana. And Shrutadev, the Brahmana, has a simple dwelling and it's very basic, very fruit and it puts everyone on the floor, gives everyone a seat on the floor, and brings them some very, very simple prasadam. It's so amazing how Krishna is he's so satisfied in both situations. It's not overwhelmed by the opulence, and he's not inconvenienced by the basic uh, nature of the reception with Shrutadev. Lord Krishna is happy with his devotees. Both of them were devotees, Maharaj Bahulasva and Shrutadev. They were both wonderful devotees and they both received the Lord according to their means. And that pleased Lord Krishna. That was pleasing to him. So Lord Krishna is pleased by devotion. <coughs> Only those with devotion can understand Krishna. With no devotion, the common people, if they have no devotion, they cannot understand what are these activities, what is going on. How can a little boy pick up a hill and hold it up for seven days? It's all mythology, do you think? Certainly, it certainly, it sounds unreal, not of this world, but the Lord is not of this world. He is transcendental to this world. He is not only not of this world, he is the source of this world. It all comes from him. He is sarva karana karanam. He is the cause of all causes. Everything comes from Him. So before anyone can understand the pastimes of Lord Krishna, let them first of all hear about the Lord's potencies in creation. And you can see how systematic the Srimad Bhagavatam is presented. Right? What is the title of the first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam? Creation. Yeah. We have to learn <laughs> these things. We have to understand this process of creation. Sometimes devotees think, oh, creation. Oh. You know, they want to hear <laughs> Rasa Leela. They want to jump to the topmost level without, first of all, understanding the very important aspect 
of creation, how the Lord arranges for this phenomenal world to come into existence. And it's so amazing, it's so systematic. The more you study it, the more you become impressed. Just like, you know, when we study Sankhya philosophy, we learn about the, the five elements of material creation, earth, water, fire, air, and ether. And then we point, when you study that, that you, the Srimad Bhagavatam explains how everything comes from sound. And when Prabhupada heard that, he said, yes. Yeah. Oh, it's said in the Bible, like that, in the Bible it said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, and Prabhupada said, yes. He said, this is Srimad Bhagavatam. In the beginning was the world, was the Word. And that means sound. There has to be sound for a word to be spoken. So it's a Srimad Bhagavatam describes creation. It begins from sound. And sound is in ether. Ether is the finest element. The creation comes about from subtle to gross. The beginning of creation is ether. In ether there is sound. And then next there is air, right? With, in ether there is sound. How do, you, how do we perceive sound? With our ears. We need ears to hear. Hearing, first thing. You have to hear. And then comes, after ether comes air. And with air there is what? There is sound, there is also Touch, yes, touch, right? You feel the wind, right? When the wind blows, you can feel the, the air blowing, you know. You can feel it. So touch is there. And you perceive touch with, how do we perceive touch? Skin, with our skin. Oh, right? <laughs> you feel the cold or you feel the heat. And then after air comes, fire. And fire has? Huh? Form. Yes, form. And we see form with our eyes. And then comes water. And water has, of course, taste, the taste of water. And we perceive the taste with our hmm? And then comes the earth. And earth is smell, aroma. I am the original fragrance of the earth, the aroma, yes, the smell, with the nose. So you can see how the creation is so wonderfully, so systematically explained. Nowhere else can we find this kind of presentation of the material world and the different elements of creation and how everything is very systematically arranged. There's a person behind it. It's not just by chance, right? You get a nice cake, who made it? Somebody made it. It didn't just come out of the, the oven on its own. Somebody makes it. And similarly, where there is creation means there is a creator. There's a personality behind everything. Of course, nowadays atheism is very common. More, more our people are so bold, they even present themselves as atheists. We have atheistic governments, you know, communist countries, openly atheistic. China, for example, we are atheists. You know, their policy is atheism. They don't want religion. And uh, you get even educated, so-called educated class of people in universities, they make an atheist society. Some of uh, people I know in Australia, they had a Krishna Yoga Club at the Australia National University in Canberra. Premier Institute in Australia. 
the Australian National University in Canberra, and they had an atheistic society. Our devotees were doing their Krishna Yoga Club in the society group, in the society's hall. And after they'd finished using the hall, the next people who come in are the atheist society. <laughs> you know, and the atheist society go, look at that, look at these crazy people, you know. Uh, it's so, so incredible. They're supposed to be educated people and they cannot understand that there's God. They're atheists. So unfortunate people. And therefore, Prabhupada mentions in the purport, last sentence, is they're destined to remain in matter. They only believe in matter, they will remain in matter, birth after birth. They'll take body, they'll never get out of this world. Okay, any comments, or, Maharaj? Anything? Am I preaching in the universities? Well, if I get a chance, yeah. <laughs> I never usually get a chance. Are you, we, uh, we preach to people who go to university. I don't, the, the universities, they don't like us to come in so much. They're afraid. Like in India, you know, in India, the devotees were going there to the universities, they were preaching so much. The college is bad, <laughs> don't come anymore, we don't want you coming anymore. Because they were making devotees, they were getting people to become devotees. So. <laughs> Anyway, we certainly were interested to preach to people from the university. If they're ready, if they're willing to hear. We'd certainly try to get into the universities. It's not always possible. But Prabhupada liked us to preach to these kind of people. We thought the educated people, they can become strong devotees. If you get people who are illiterate, then, it, you know, they can also be devotees, but it's, you know, the, their progress will be slow and not easy. We do try. We have, we have some people illiterate, some elderly people, illiterate, and we make arrangements for them to get also association. They may not be able to read, but they're able to hear. And if they're willing to hear, we have devotees sit and read to them and explain to them. So not only educated people, we're interested in everyone. We see Krishna in the hearts of all living entities. And we try to benefit all living entities by giving them Krishna consciousness. Okay. Yes, Guru. This statement, thank you very much, Maharaj, for your nice class. This statement there in the, in the Brahmacharya about the may create sometimes even bewilderment amongst practitioners of devotional service because it is said that the Lord is only present and we know that these expansions in different forms like the Atma Jnana, the, the Super Soul is not only in the, in the heart of all the living entities but it's also in all the atoms. At a certain point there must acceptance and trust that the Lord is beyond even my because, because speculation may come in there at that point where actually there will be a doubt about the Lord. <laughs> How do you explain that? 
But he's all pervading. Yes, all pervading. He's all pre omnipresent. He's omnipresent. And they see everything as God. Yeah. Is it like he's... pantheism? Yeah. That the whole everything is God. They, they, if they don't appreciate that God is also a person. He has his own abode. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there are different phases. You know that. Some people realize God through the impersonal Brahman, and then others know the Lord through this Paramatma feature. But the ultimate realization of the Lord is Bhagavan. That's the most, that's the highest level. And it's also the most difficult, the most challenging one to come to that level, to understand that the Lord is not only in the hearts of all living entities, he's not only all pervading, but he's a person also. And that's discussed in te teachings of Queen Kunti, that uh, she, she brings up that point that some people, they think of the Lord as being all pervading and it's not so easy for them to understand that the Lord is also existing as a person, as well as being everywhere. It's not that he's lost his individuality, but that all-pervading presence, that's his, his, his potency as a super soul. But at the same time, he remains a person. And he's, as a person, he also enjoys, like all of us. We all want to enjoy. He's a person. He also. Why do we, why do we want to enjoy? That enjoyment is there in him. He is the supreme enjoyer. And so we have similar qualities to the Lord, but not in the same quantity. We also want to enjoy because that nature is there in him. So he, but he enjoys unlimitedly. And his, his pleasure is being with the devotees, not just simply on his own, not just simply sitting on a throne and overseeing everything. You know, the, other traditions, religious traditions, they have no concept of God. One time in the Philippines, Tamal Krishna Goswami came there and he, he arranged a meeting with a man called Cardinal Sin. He, he was a Chinese Filipino who had become a cardinal in the Catholic Church. The Philippines was... Uh, it was conquered by the Spanish, ruled by the Spanish for a long time, and they introduced the Catholic religion to everyone, because Spain is, of course, a Catholic country. So uh, they introduced the Catholic religion. So it's the main religion there in the Philippines. So this one man, he had become, the, the church, the, the Vatican had made him a cardinal. So Tamal Krishna Goswami met him. And Tamal Krishna Goswami had a number of questions to ask him. <laughs> you know, to ask him about what's, what's it like in this kingdom of God? And what, what is God like? And, and, and the cardinal would just say, oh no, this is not in our tradition. We don't have this in our theology. We have no explanation of this in our theology. You know, supposed to be, you know, it's the, the, a very powerful, very prominent religion. But if you ask basic questions like, tell me about the kingdom of God, what goes on there, what is the form of God, what is, tell me about his, his nature as, as a person, they have no answer, nothing, cannot explain. Not only Catholic Church, other traditions also. They, they have no answer. But we only get the perfect explanations here 
in books like Srimad Bhagavatam, everything is described in a very perfect manner. And it's presented, of course, by Srila Vyasadeva himself, who is an empowered incarnation. He is a Shakta, Shakta Visha avatar to present this knowledge to all of us. Anarto Pasamad Sakshat Bhakti Yoga Adhoksaji. Uh, in Srimad Bhagavatam, it says how Srila Vyasadeva compiled this Vedic literature, the Srimad Bhagavatam, because he saw the people were suffering so much because of ignorance, because of their ignorance, their poor knowledge. Therefore, he compiled the Srimad Bhagavatam. Out of his compassion for them, he compiled this Srimad Bhagavatam. You have a question? Uh, you said that uh, the materialists, they say there were karmas. There is no proof of your mythology or your stories. And uh, as you pointed out, uh, for us, like we, we see it all the time. You know, the creation is so perfectly created and so we see the proof all the time. But how can we have more, what should we do to have more direct experience of the Lord? You know, directing our life. We may, you know, there are some of the country that is the tasting water, but how can we perceive the Lord being directly in charge of our life and arranging everything more? How can we, what can we do to have more experience of that? Well, if we are, if we have surrendered to the Lord, then the Lord is placing us under His divine potency. Mahatmanas to Mamparta, Daivim Prakritim Ashrita. The great souls are under the protection of my divine energy. And of course, those who have not surrendered, they're under the modes of nature. And so you're under the three modes of nature. Tamagun, Rajagun, Sattvagun. We're, we're controlled in everything and every step. People talk about freedom. The freedom is to choose. Do you want to be under the modes of nature or do you want to be under the divine energy? That is the freedom. That is the independence which we have. And everything else is we're controlled. People think we're free, but actually they're, they're controlled. People say, I'm free. I can eat whatever I like. You people, you have to be vegetarian. You can't eat this or you can't do that. I can do what I like. You know, I'm free. They're thinking. That is their ignorance. They are controlled. Right? The gunas, the rajagun, the tamagun are controlling them. They're not free at all. They're fully controlled. Tell them, just try stop. Try to stop smoking. Stop drinking. They can't do it. They can't give up their bad habits because they're controlled. And we're, the devotees are also controlled. We're controlled by the divine nature of Krishna. That we, we, we chant Hare Krishna. Mm -hmm. We, we, come to the temple program, we only eat prasadam, we're controlled, <laughs> right? Krishna is controlling us, he's taking care of the devotees, he arranges for them. We see sometimes devotees have no money, where does the money, suddenly somebody will come along, give the money, pay the bill. I was just a Jananda Maharaj told me in, in France at New Mayapur, a couple of years back, they got, the government came and told them they were going to close them down because they, they were a big fire threat there. And they were, to, to bring the New Mayapur mansion up to standard was going to cost nearly 1 million euros. And so where to get the money? One million euros, you know, a huge amount of money. And they didn't have money. Anyway, you know, they, they started putting things on the, on the internet and 
approaching people, and gradually, somehow or other, Krishna gave them the money. They got the money and they could make all the improvements necessary. It, it was amazing. Krishna provides. So we see how Krishna is controlling. Many examples like that in devotees in difficulties and Krishna helps them. Krishna takes care. Okay. Yes, Mary. Can we just um, lie down and say that Krishna takes care? Can we just lie down and think Krishna takes care? Well, how can long can you lie course? down for? <laughs> <laughs> no, but just, you know, take it easy and think Krishna. Yeah, Krishna's, Krishna will take care, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, but a devotee doesn't. Servant, one who's a, the, the the real devotee doesn't think like that. No. The real devotee thinks that Krishna is doing so much for me. I want to serve Krishna. Mm -hmm. I want to give service to Krishna. I don't want to take from Krishna. Yeah. So it's the foolishness of a person to think, oh, Krishna will take care. You know, that is. That laziness, that lazy mentality is there in Kali Yuga, that ignorance. So, that is not the mood of a devotee, of course. Devotee will never sit back. Devotee likes to work for Krishna. Of course, there, there's the, the Python philosophy. Right? The python, the python just waits. Wherever he will just wait for some somebody to come, you know, or something to come. Something comes by, then he then only get it. doesn't go looking for anything. And so that's described in fifth canto, like Rishabdev, like that, laying there. Even he's passing stool and everything. He's rolling in the stool. <laughs> so that's a uh, very special level. That's to make Krishna for your servant. You make Krishna as your servant instead of you are the servant. Yes, well, if the, if the thinking is like that, yeah. the, but the great, the, even like Rishabh, he's not thinking like that. He just, he just doesn't want to do anything. That, that he doesn't see any point to do anything. So that that's similar to that Jain philosophy, that became of course the, like the Jain teachings. There's a religion called Jainism and it's, it's similar to Buddhism. I heard that uh, one of the reasons why Buddhism was driven out of India, be because in Buddhism, the whole of India was into Buddhism. Even Mathura was the Buddhist capital. And you go to the museum in Mathura, it's full of Buddhist relics. Then it's the birthplace of Lord Krishna, but so much Buddhism was there in Mathura. The mu museum is just full of all these Buddhas. So why did Buddhism get driven out of India? Because people were just doing nothing. <laughs> because the whole, the whole Buddhist idea is, you know, do nothing, you know. Don't see no evil, hear no evil, speak no... What do they... They don't do anything, you know, they just sit, meditate, you know. And the result was nothing got done. There was no farming, there was no production. The whole place just became overrun with wheat, everything just growing wild. So they saw that this is not the way. Then they brought back Varnashram. And Shankaracharya came with the Brahmana. And they brought back, they organized the society, got people working. Sit back, do not, nothing. 
If everyone sits back and does, then it's a problem. When Prabhupada was in Geneva 50 years ago, this year, Prabhupada was in Geneva, he'd spent 10 days there. He met the mayor, and the mayor, at that time, our temple was in Geneva. And there were many young men all joining Hare Krishna movement. Every day the devotees were there in the street chanting and everything. So the, the mayor said to Prabhupada, he said to Prabhupada, he said, Swamiji, what will happen if all the young men become Hare Krishnas? <laughs> Prabhupada thought it was very funny. <laughs> it's very... Prabhupada explained to him about Vanashram, you know, that not everybody will just be chanting Hare Krishna. We'll have Brahmins and Kshatriyas and Vaishya and Sudra, you know. And some people will be chanting, but people have to work and there will be, you know, society has to be organized. <laughs> but, but Prabhupada remembered how this mayor had asked him, what would happen if everyone, all the men become Hare Krishna devotees? <laughs> There were so many people joining the movement, the mayor was thinking, oh, <laughs> there'll be no young people, everyone will be a Hare Krishna monk. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> okay, yes? Yes, of course. He, he presented the Krishna book in such a way that even though we're neophytes, we could understand it. He, he presented it very carefully so that even though we were neophyte devotees, and Prabhupada writes in the, in the preface of the book, he said, this book will be appreciated by uh, those people who are fully enlightened, they will take pleasure in hearing the pastimes of Lord Krishna. Those people who are endeavouring to become enlightened will also enjoy reading the Krishna book. It will help them to progress more. And those people who are not even devotees, who are just mundaners, they will also get pleasure from reading the, and hearing the pastimes of Krishna. Because in the Krishna book there is love stories, there's drama, there's crime, there's war. All many different incidents are described. So Prabhupada said this book will be interesting for everyone. Of course Prabhupada wanted to present the pastimes of Krishna because he, he did not know how long he would remain in this world. And he was concerned that we should have the opportunity to hear the pastimes of Lord Krishna. He didn't know how long he would remain and to come to the tenth canto, he knew that was going to, it took him many years to come up to the tenth canto. So he gave us that Krishna book early, prematurely, but he wanted us to have that opportunity to hear. But initially he came to America with the first canto, Srimad Bhagavatam. Later on he published Krishna book. I joined the movement in 1971. The first volume had come out. I purchased the first volume before I became a devotee. I purchased it from a bookstore and it brought me to the temple. So. Uh, Later on, the second volume came out. So it's like 71, 72. But even before that, he had published also Nectar of Devotion. Because his Guru Maharaj had told him also, this is a very important book. You should study this book carefully. So he was eager to publish the Nectar of Devotion. And Sri Ishopanishad. That was also published very, that was taken from 
articles which Prabhupada had written in his Back to Godhead magazine. He was already writing Back to Godhead magazine, so the Sri Ishapanishad, they were excerpts published inside his Back to Godhead magazine. So when he went to America, he told the devotees that they could take these different articles, put them and make a book, make the Ishopanishad book and print that book. It's also a very important book because people who are uh, jnanis or Vedantists, they don't accept Srimad Bhagavatam. They don't accept Bhagavad Gita. They're Vedantists, you know, like Ramakrishna Mission and people like that. They only give classes on Vedanta, on the Upanishads. Upanishads are part of Vedanta. So Prabhupada said, go publish this book, Isha Upanishads. It's very good. Even somebody's a, a jnani or a Vedantist, okay, this is from the Vedas, Isha Upanishad. You can read this. Okay. I've got some nuts here, prasada. I wanted to distribute. You can help me eat them. Please take a few nuts. <laughs> 